Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Nick Dawson, editor in chief of Talk House Podcast. Last fall, the writer, director, and actor Tom Gilroy wrote an excellent piece for TalkHouse tied to his sharply satirical COVID short film, Waynesville Strong. After, he asked if TalkHouse might be interested in doing something on the C100 Film Corp, a production company run by two of his friends. The company's principals aren't just any old people, though. They're legendary indie writer-director Jim McKay and REM frontman Michael Stipe. From that initial email grew this episode of the podcast. It's a conversation between Stipe and McKay about the company they've built together and the remarkable work and friendships that came out of it. Stipe and McKay readily admit they aren't business-oriented in how they've run C100. Their ethos is to make art, not money. And maybe that's why the company's name isn't more widely known. But the C100 filmography speaks for itself. It includes all of McKay's films, from Girls Town and Our Song to his most recent En El Septimo Dia, plus a raft of other notable works such as Chris Smith and Sarah Price's American Movie, Christopher Munch's The Sleepy Time Girl, Gilroy's Spring Forward, Cheryl Dunye's Stranger Inside, Jem Cohen's Benjamin Smoke, and Josh Fox's Memorial Day. As they talk about C-100's story, Stipe and McKay traverse from a defining walk they took around San Francisco in 1986 to the company's humble beginnings in Athens, making PSAs with KRS-One and Natalie Merchant, and Michael making the original Orange is the New Black at the Sundance Film Festival back in the 1990s. Beyond C-100, the two also touch on their latest projects, McKay's new film and the photography book which Stipe just published, and how the pandemic and the present moment, as we stand on the cusp of a return to normality, have affected them both creatively and personally. Should we start by saying, we met by Zoom. Uh, late December and uh, late May, Michael was wearing a uh, <laughs> matching headset and sweatshirt combo. <laughs> I saw an interview last week in something and the length of the paragraph about what the person was wearing when they met them at the restaurant was tragic. It was just went on and on and on and on and on. I was like, oh, my God, we won't do that. OK, we won't do that. But we could start by identifying our voices. That's a good start. So I'm Michael Stipe. This is my voice. And I'm talking to Jim McKay. And we are starting this conversation for Talk House with kind of a, an introduction to our film company, which is called C100 Film Corp, and how the birth of that kind of led us onto the visual film and video paths and otherwise in the last 35 years, because C100 was founded in 1987. As an intro, and since no one in the world knows who the fuck C100 is. <laughs> I'll do something really quick. What I thought before, as I was preparing for this, was that if you look up C100 online, you might not even be able to find anything about it either. So, which is a testament to what amazing business people we are. I did think, well, maybe in the aftermath of this interview, I'll start a website called c100filmcorp.com. Or I have a website that just went up called jimmckayfilm.com, and maybe I'll put up the information on that. But basically, just at least to have a list of all the projects we've done in the last 35 years, I think might be smart. Yeah, and maybe links to the people that we did it with, because that's a whole universe of really talented, incredible people. I could also put it up at michaelstype.com, because I now have michaelstype.com, which I'm not terribly active on, but there it is. And Perfect. absolutely unactive, inactive, is that the term, on social media, because I despise it. And that's been a glorious blessing of my life for the past couple of years. Completely avoiding that particular strata of desperate culture <laughs> is nice. And anxiety. And anxiety, yeah. God knows we don't need more of that at this point. But yes, I mean, I have to say, you sent me this list of all the projects that C100 worked on, and I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe how much we did in the amount of time that we had, starting with. And I mean, I have to say, you know, I have some real favorites here, but... My really most favorites are your feature films, Jim McKay. Mm. Uh, looking at every single one of them and, and watching you develop and grow as a filmmaker and as a storyteller has been one of the great joys of my adult life. And then being able to participate on, on whatever producerial and best friend level has been just incredible. And I, I'm so proud of I'm so proud of you, but I'm so proud of, wow, 
looking at this list and going like, holy Christ, that's a very impressive list of film projects and and particularly of, of your features. So there. Thanks, pal. You're welcome. <laughs> that's so sweet. That's really nice. And, you know, not to do the mutual back scratching to death or anything, but it wouldn't have been possible without you, really. You know, it all started with a walk around the streets of San Francisco in like 1980 six or five or something when I was talking about maybe going to film school or maybe like just shooting this documentary I had an idea for, which became Lighthearted Nation. And one of the things I love about you is that you're not, you're not always the do this person. You should do this one. You know, it's, you definitely like plant the seeds of, you know, and there's a lot of kind of, well, what do you think? Because if this, da, 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 da. Anyway, I ended up not going to film school, thank God. Well, I always thought I was so incredibly obvious and so like, <laughs> preacherly and hectoring in that regard. But that's exactly how I remember was the, the walk in San Francisco and you saying, I want to go to film school and me saying, fuck film school, just make a movie. Yeah. And that's my memory of it. And I think that's actually what you went on and did, huh? Yes. And then you were on tour uh, a couple of years later after I had, you know, spent some time driving around the country and doing this or that. And I was running out of money for my my travels. And you said, come down to Athens. There's lots of food service jobs. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and I was like, yes. And that's when, so when I went down to Athens, I had already shot the material for Lighthearted Nation. And Athens and Atlanta were where I learned how to edit. And then we said, okay, let's start. You know, uh, you were doing a lot of film work through the band, yeah. through REM, and in my mind, were a filmmaker in your own right as a result of that, even though, you know, some people wouldn't label all the projects films, but even in the earlier tours, you were putting together the footage that was being screened behind the band, you were making the videos, they were not traditional videos. And so I think we both said, let's just make something official that encompasses our work and, you know, you know what we should do is we should sell videos. We should sell VHS tapes through the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a great idea at the time. Yeah. Actually very forward of us. This is pre-Blockbuster. I mean, who remembers that, right? I don't think even Blockbuster existed at that point. It might have. It probably, it might have, but it was definitely well, it like... it sucked that they did. I think it was prescient in terms of what we did become and what a kind of non-business we always were. Like, I, what was that? Oh, there was that magazine called Op? Was it called? Yep, Op? yep, yep. I remember Option, that. option, option. And it was like a music and culture magazine. It was yep. slightly underground. And a lot of the stuff that we were interested in was being written about in there. And so, and we were like, you know, we can put out some VHS tapes and we'll do these great um, letterpress cardboard covers. It'll be a piece of art in and of itself. And we can make them really cheap. And then we'll take out an ad in Op. Option magazine, <laughs> and people could send us a check. And we could put it in the mail, and that's what we did. We did Lighthearted Nation, and we put out Just Hold Still, a yeah. compilation of short films by Jem Cohen, and then we put out Figures, a compilation of short films by James Herbert, and we sold them in the mail and kind of did some quote unquote press, which was usually meant, you know, usually meant you did an interview for REM and ended up trying to talk somehow. Talking about, about film in video, yeah. <laughs> but um, it was a little ridiculous. And it was also, I think, centered around the ethos of like the Discord type ethos and the option. Yeah. Total DIY, yeah. But also I always, I mean, I, I think I was maybe not full of myself, but I, I had discovered with the first couple of records with R.E.M. and with the success that we had, uh, I'm referring to my former band at that point, that if you follow your instinct in art and in creating things, if you follow your instinct, if you stay true to yourself, you put something out there, your audience is going to find you, you know, if, because that voice is, is genuine and authentic. And through whatever methods we had at the time, remember, kids, this was the 1980s. It was pre-everything. Mm. And through whatever distribution, because we now know with the advent of digital technology and how that's taken over the world and created a, its own revolution, that distribution is really at the basis of what everything is about, you know, truthfully. But my ethos, I guess, is that the right word, was that if you stay true to yourself, if you if you have something that's authentic, your voice is going to be found by the people who need to find it. And so, you know, our methods were, for the time, I mean, it was pretty cool what we were doing, actually, looking back. And I think we also had like enough of a circle. It was a small circle, but it was, it was basically this, you know, it's like, we will hear about stuff. You know, we're, we're 
hooked into enough of a network of interesting artists and people where, you know, someone's going to say, have you seen this person's short film or whatever? And I mean, there's a danger in that because typically that kind of a setup can lead to just insiders or just a certain kind of genre or, or vibe of work coming out of a certain place. But I also think we did a pretty good job at not getting caught in that. You know, if you look at some of the first, some of the early things that we did, they were all kind of, we found, you know, Tree Shade, this short film um, by Lisa Collins, which Lisa Collins, yeah. she had already been working on it, but we helped support the finish of it. And Sleepy Time Gal, Christopher Munch, like how do we, how do we find these people who we we didn't necessarily know firsthand, but I think other people introduced, we saw stuff in the press, we saw stuff at film festivals, whatever. And it wasn't this kind of full court press let's hire some staff and read the New Yorker every week and start optioning interesting articles to make into films. It was more like, let's just make some shit that we really like, that we would like to see, you know? And Lisa Collins was one, that's one of the, actually looking at this list, I'm like, this is one of the uh, enduring relationships uh, from the work that we did through C100 that in my life, I feel so profoundly honored to have her and her completely whacked out like a uh, sensibility mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a friend, as someone who, you know, the, the work that she does as a filmmaker is really, truly iconoclastic and wild. I mean, she's, mm -hmm. she is a wild artist yeah. and I love having that kind of that voice in my life. And uh, she actually helped me through a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, lockdown, a lot of COVID. She kept me kind of laughing, you know, in a way. Chris Munch, I was texting last week, you know, talking about what he's doing. He's, I think currently in New Orleans and hanging out with friends and exploring some new ideas for feature films that he's working on. Jim Herbert, by the way, I think, and I became recently obsessed with, uh, we're talking about a very early 1980s Athens band called Limbo District, but wasn't Limbo District part of Figures, the Jim Herbert compilation? Am I wrong? Not that I remember, unless they did. Maybe I, this, they might have done, their music might have been part of one of the films, but... I don't specifically remember that. I thought there was a thing that Jim did. I, I know that he did a thing with Limbo District. Anyway, that music has come back uh, full circle for me, along with Benjamin Smoke, the later documentary that Jim Cohen made through C100 about Benjamin in Atlanta and the end of his life and the, the beauty of that guy's brain and his activism and his work as a singer, songwriter, as an artist, as a lyricist. We touched on some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And then this that same weird distribution idea came into play when we did three series of public service announcements yeah. <laughs> uh, called Direct Effect. And again, it was like me up in the warehouse space above the grit, sitting there in the 95 degree, no air conditioning, <laughs> and surrounded by boxes of literally like boxes of three quarter inch videotapes that we, you know, we would make a series of PSAs of seven PSAs we would do some kind of like press conference, which in those, those days actually people would kind of come to. And and it was because you were involved and then, you know. KRS-One, KRS Natalie One, Merchant. And exactly. And yeah. And then they would put a little blurb in Spin Magazine about it and people would call us on the landline at, at the space in Athens. And, and the whole deal was like, call us, and if you want a tape, we'll send it to you for free and play it on public access or play it on your local cable station. And we actually sent out a lot of tapes. And today it would just be put it up on YouTube, I guess, or yeah. you know, put it up on some kind of channel, which is great. And MTV played a bunch yeah, of those. You know? They did. They're, I mean, we got pretty good distribution through that. I'm also, I'm really proud. I remember mine was about organic farming. That was pretty prescient, too. I mean, I find myself now, you know, overwhelmed by uh, the organic section at Whole Foods. I don't shop at Whole Foods, actually. I just said that out loud. But I walk by it, but I shop at the other cooler <laughs> grocery store because I don't like Whole Foods. <laughs> but it's kind of great how that whole thing has come full circle, you know, and there's a lot more recognition or understanding of, of the importance of how our food has grown. Mm -hmm. That's something that we were on really early. Are we just buttering ourselves up here? Are we making ourselves seem like the coolest guys on earth? Well, it's exciting. I mean, it is. Yes, we are, but it is... <laughs> It's exciting to be able to look back and be proud of, I think, work that we played a part. I just think it was, a, I, personally, I'm proud of the idea that it was a different model. I'm looking at like American movie, to me, is probably in certain ways like a shining moment. And that came about because 
we met Chris Smith and Sarah Price at probably at Sundance when Chris was there with American Job. Right. And he told us all about this other film. This was one of the oddest stories, but this is totally representative of how we worked. That same year, you were there. We, we were there for other stuff. It might have been Girls Town. It was the Girls Town year. Okay. It was the Girls Town year. We were there showing Girls Town, premiering Girls Town. And you had been in touch with MTV and they were doing this very odd series of little 30 second spots right. that could be about anything you wanted it to be about. So just describe what <laughs> yours was. Well, mine, I decided that my spot should be called Orange is the New Black. <laughs> and I, I don't know why. I was We were staying in a shitty condo with a kind of 1970s op art orange painting behind the couch and inviting people over after uh, after films and and drinking and, and hanging out on the couch. And I looked up and I saw the orange and I was like, well, there, that, that's it. So Orange is the New Black was my, I wonder if that's available. I wonder if you can find that. Uh, yeah, I, I actually have it. Yeah. I don't know if it's online or not. Isn't Jimmy Duvall? Jimmy Duvall and Anna Grace. Yeah. And Anna Grace. It's so fucking funny. It's really good. <laughs> it is so funny. And Brian Cates edited it. And of course, this was in 1995. So it was about two decades before the TV show called Orange is the New Black. And it has nothing to do with women in prison. So MTV was getting artists to do these things and paying a very large amount of money as if it was a commercial, because it was a commercial yeah. for MTV. So we made this thing in the condo there on like probably like a high eight camera and went out to the supermarket and bought a bunch of props for $70. And then we're able to, you know, a couple of months later, send Chris and Sarah $50,000 to continue to shoot American movie because they weren't finished filming. Yeah. And, you know, we were like, hey, what you sent to us looks great. It sounds great. Here's this money. <laughs> and they, you know, six, nine months later, Chris gets back to me. He's like, hey, we have an edit. Do you want to see it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then at that point, we got further involved, definitely more involved with watching cuts. We were never like on set or anything, but we were able at that point to put in another chunk of money. And then... The film came out. It did really well. We got our money back. That was one of the few projects where we actually got the money back. So did we pay ourselves or this, that, or the other thing? No. We took that money and we were able to put that into other films, which might have been Tree Shade or might have been Brother to Brother or coming up much, much later, a film like Foreplay by Kyle Henry. So the whole idea was we're not doing this to make money. So any money we make ever. And as I got further established and I was started making stuff that I actually got paid on, we were able to take production company fees from those things, from films like Everyday People or Angel Rodriguez. And again, they didn't come to us and go into our pockets. They just allowed us to then give money to filmmakers. Right. It's a really ass backwards business model, um, <laughs> but it's not- But look what we made. Look yes, what we helped exactly. make. I mean, look what we helped create. It was it was wonderful. It was super cool. It was wonderful. The Chris Smith thing really came full circle for me a couple of years ago. I got invited to, it was a documentary starring Jim Carrey about the making of Man on the Moon and how he got really deeply into the character of Andy Kaufman. So I met Jim on that film because it was, the, the whole film project was started because of the, the R.E.M. song Man on the Moon about Andy Kaufman, which kind of raised all this interest in him. And I went to this opening at MoMA here in New York. And um, I was, I saw Spike Jones. I was like, oh, hey, Spike, how's it going? Nice, nice that you're here. And he's like, well, yeah, I, I, I um, executive produced this. I'm like, oh, that's so awesome. How cool. Are you going to stay for later? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll be here. They're, they're, after the film, they were doing a conversation with Jim Carrey. So then the credits roll and it's Chris Smith is the director of the thing. I had no idea. I just went, you know, because I was like, oh, oh this is kind of interesting. They're all on stage talking about it after the film. And Spike references me and kind of pulls me out of the audience and they put another chair up there. And I was like, wow, this is so cool because here's Jim Carrey, who I met through this film that came from a song. Here's Spike Jones, who I worked with with the other film company that I had at the time for his first feature. And here's Chris Smith, who I met through you, and we worked with him on his first feature. And it felt like this kind of beautiful, like, I don't know, it felt like a graduating class or something <laughs> of creative people had kind of all come together in this confluence. And the documentary was actually quite funny and good. We financed a crazy fucking movie called Memorial Day. That was the first thing that Josh Fox made that almost no one's seen, but is 
kind of amazing. And he went on to make Gasland and Gasland 2 and is doing tons of stuff in both the political and the film world. Yeah, and then he and I wound up hanging out together on the campaign trail for Bernie Sanders in 2016, which was a great way to kind of bring him back into the fold. So, yeah, so I think it's definitely something to be proud of. And maybe on our 35th anniversary. Which is next year, is that right? Yeah. Good Lord. We'll, like, do some screenings or something. I would love that. Between now and then, though, we really have to get the website up. I mean, that would be... Yes. That'd be a good start. (laughs) (laughs) We got a year. Excellent. I was trying to figure out a, a good, I'm, tr- I'm sitting here going, how do I segue this into this other thing I want to talk about? Pizza? I want to talk I'm about pizza. Gonna, Are we going to have gonna... pizza night this, this week? <laughs> Are we doing pizza night? We might be taking a break for a week. Okay. All right. All right. That's right. But um, no, I, I wanted to talk to you about, because like, again, my my experience in Athens was having you there to, you know, you saw something in my work and me in my, I don't know what, in my brain or in my, you know, I hadn't really created that much work at that point and really, really supported that. And I saw that all around you all the time. You also have a real, you really have your finger on the pulse, I think, of younger artists and youthful, younger energy in art. Mm. And I see you showing that support in many, many different ways all the time. And it's something I admire because I'm, I feel like, Sometimes I feel very curmudgeonly about my, you know, I don't know. I can be skeptical of the kids at times. And then at the same time, I have to realize that I am also, when I see a young person stuff that I actually connect with in a big way, I jump in and I do say, hey, you know, let me see if I can help you make this next thing or whatever. So it's there. But I just think you're just, you've got this really like open, it's like an aura-y kind of thing. And it's impressive to me. It's obviously useful to you as an artist as well. You want to talk about that at all? Well, I mean, I think what you're referring to, I guess, is a curiosity and and a desire to not kind of feel stuck in not only uh, generationally stuck as we age and not opening ourselves up to new ideas and new things that are coming along and the language of a younger generation. But I got that curiosity, I think, mostly through my mother. And she just has this immense love of life and people and a curiosity that is enviable. So I think I got that honest, you know, from her. I almost want to flip and say, I've always felt that way about you, you know, that you you have this intellect and this gentleness to you, but also within the gentleness is a real desire to create a dialogue about issues. And some of them are very human and some of them are more political in nature, but that works its way into your work as a filmmaker. It also manifests itself very deeply in your life. I mean, you're the one who has kids who have taught me about things that I wouldn't have known because I don't have kids about their generation and about, about about their circles of friends and their interests, just being around them from time to time. But you also have this group of people, many of whom you met through the work that you did as a filmmaker, but right, right. that you've mentored to use a, an often kind of overstated word. And Tom's the same way, you know, Tom Gilroy, you guys right. both find people that have something that you see that maybe other people don't see And you're like, I'm going to encourage and push this person to create, to take photographs, to develop their interest in film, to write. And these are, you know, when you have a big barbecue at your place, those are the people that I meet over and over and over again. Again, Lisa Collins is a great example of that, but it brought her back into my sphere uh, Mm -hmm. in, in this past year when I really needed... I needed her particular brand of surreal humor, you know, to help me through lockdown. She was there. She and her partner kept me laughing, you know, at times when I I didn't know that I I maybe had forgotten how to laugh. That's nice. I mean, maybe that's something that we both share because I don't think of myself that way. You know, I I have this reputation in the the world of music for having mentored these younger people. And it's really uh, always never, it never feels like that to me. It just feels like, oh, well, this is a, a relationship and a friendship. And then maybe you give perspective just through your honesty to a situation or you tell someone, you know, this is when you need to breathe. Like, don't forget to breathe. Like, it's important to breathe. It's not mentoring as much as just kind of being completely present and acknowledging while we all go through periods where, you know, it's good to hear someone else's perspective. The thing that's really shared is the curiosity part. I think as a maker, you know, that's your number one tool that's your number one instinct but i guess for me like my work starts from like a story point you know and it's so my curiosity is always just about watching people they don't even have to be people i know and to, and actually usually they're not but just kind of being out there and experience you know when i i had this 
moment like three weeks ago or four weeks ago, and I've had a couple since then of being out in public, being one was in McGorrick Park in Greenpoint and one was actually in Manhattan last week where I was out sitting on park benches and just watching people again yeah. and being able to overhear conversations. Like, and it just occurred to me how absent that was. I knew going into this time, I remember one of the last days in, it was last, you know, in March when it was clear that the city was going to shut down to some degree. I remember being out, maybe it was even a little later than that. Cause I remember it was kind of warm out and I was in Chinatown, I think, and I was just walking and I was like watching this one person in particular and kind of following them a little bit and just, you know, I'm always going like, he might be what my next movie is about. She might be the next, you know, and thinking what's going to happen if, if you can't sit in a park or, or wander, if I can't do this yeah, yeah. and then having a year where you couldn't do it. Yeah. A year divorced from that, you know, and I know that your antenna is totally focused in that way too, but also as like a visual artist, which is all, it's always storytelling, but I think there's a visual and cultural element to your curiosity that I maybe don't have quite as much. Whereas you're just constantly just zeroing in on influence, you know, inspiration, inspiration, I think everywhere. And it, it could just be a random piece of mispainted something, but it's not necessarily an artist's work. But oftentimes it is, you know, and I just I think I've always like wanted to be more open about that. I think that my brain goes toward in a weird way to in the opposite direction. Like when I think about how much I admire, like two people who I admire as filmmakers, an immense amount, Jim Herbert and Frederick Wiseman, and who basically I've said in a it's a somewhat facetious thing, but it's like they've to some degree made the same movie over and over. <laughs> like they don't change what right, they do. Right. They change the subject of it every time, but they're locked into this thing and they're career artists in that way. They've found their thing and they do it. And I love, I just, for some, there's something about that that I just really connect to. And I guess in a weird way, that's the opposite of this other thing, which is like taking in a youthful, young, newly discovered method of creating or technology or whatever and putting it into your work. I don't know. I'm thinking about your films and it feels like you, in a way, you've kind of done the same thing with the dynamic within a group and experiences that you don't necessarily have on a personal level, but it's a bit, but it's more about observation. And you've done that over and over and over again as well. True, you're right. And I do think in this past year, in the last couple of months, someone asked me, my sister asked me like, are you thinking about a new movie? You got something you know, you want to do? And I was like, no. Right away, I said no. <laughs> and I've never said no. <laughs> I've never, since the first movie I made, I've always been thinking about, I can't wait to make another. And all of a sudden, I'm kind of like not feeling that, but I am feeling drawn toward a change in the work, which is partially what I think this Jericho Walk documentary that I'm working on with um, some collaborators is about just to try and break out even further from the narrative structure and into something that's a little bit more experimental in some way, which is exciting. I mean, you're in the middle of making Jericho Walk, but does it feel interstitial? It doesn't. It feels like maybe a shift in direction as a filmmaker. I can't tell. Can you describe a little bit for, because I, I know what it's about, but listeners don't. Jericho Walk's like an observational, it's a ex semi-experimental observational documentary about an action that was taking place every Thursday at uh, 1, 11 a.m., for seven years at the 26 Federal Plaza, which is the immigration building in downtown Manhattan. And uh, Furi Hazaman and Jeff Reichert and I went there last winter and filmed it in real time with 10 cameras, 10 collaborative camera people. We're trying to figure out what it is really, but it's a completely, completely different non-narrative undertaking. I think I spent a lot of years kind of in the back of my mind thinking or waiting for someone to give me money to make my kind of movie, but bigger. And I think mm, the la finally <laughs> with NL Septimo D, I think it finally just really sunk in. Like that's not going to happen. <laughs> and it might not have happened. It might be, have not happened because you don't really, really want it to happen. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't matter really why it didn't happen, but I don't think it's going to happen. I don't know if I care anymore. I think now I care more about, right. I've always cared about making the kind of film that I want to see. You know, and right now the kind of film that I want to see is not a normal narrative 
fiction piece. So I don't know. We'll see what, where that goes. And you have a book out, which is not your first book in any way. Thank you for bringing the book up. But we, we can talk about that. But I just want to say, I don't think Ana Septimodia comes across at all as a fictional narrative. I mean, that, that's the beauty of the film is that it really, I felt uh, immersed into a world that I had been around my whole life, but had never felt immersed into. And it kind of actually radically opened my eyes to what that world is in a very, like, thank you, beautiful way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm thinking just more in form. You know, like the literal, like, I'm getting into really minimalist, repetitive kind of work. Cool. Go there. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. You know, I think you've been an influence on that as well, by virtue of the fact that you stopped making rock music and then we're making sculpture and taking photos and putting out books. And now you're making music again. And I'm sure it's going to be different in ways that we'll be pleased by. I love the books because they feel like, it really feels like a piece of art. You know, to me, it feels like um, a complete thought, even if that thought is something that I can't quite put my finger on. And I like that it's a this tangible object, you know, because with music and with lyric writing, with voice, and I love my voice, let's, let's not diminish that, but I love my voice in music and I love my voice literally, but I don't love my speaking voice. So let's be clear. But, uh, but all that stuff is intangible. It's not stuff that you can hold or put your hand on. And I, I am a kind of very object-based person in a way. And so to create a book like the most recent book, which a lot of people mistakenly think is named Michael Stipe, it's not. I, I just put my name on the spine and there's no title, but it's really a series of photographs and images of an attempt at portraiture in the year of lockdown, of, in the year of 2020. Started as a very simple portrait book. And there are, there are very simple portraits in there of people who I admire, people who, for me, embody vulnerability within strength and courage, and people who are fiercely unafraid in their life or in their choices, whether they're artists and creators or, in a few cases, sports figures, mm -hmm. who have made very bold choices as, as activists uh, to speak up for their community or to speak up for something that they feel strongly about. I felt so buoyed and uh, encouraged by these people's voices and culture uh, that I wanted to include them in the book. And so it became this really weird, it, it is actually weird. I mean, I thought when I, as always, as what always happens, when I finished it and handed it over to the publisher to print, I thought this is so obvious and so clear that I, I maybe kind of, maybe I'm over explaining what my point was with this book. And then a month later, I, I didn't think about it. A month later, after it's been printed, I picked it up and looked at it in, in a quiet moment at home on the table, at the table by myself. And I went like, this is incredibly eccentric. <laughs> Nobody is going to be able to figure out what it's really about. But it does have, a, I think, a spirit and an energy to it that's nice. And, and it, it, it does show uh, different ways of creating a portrait through someone's name or through um, their image. Or in some cases, I went back into my archive of photographs, like the picture of Gus Van Sant or the picture of Kirsten Dunst and explored portraiture that way. It has a narrative to it too, which is sneaky, but it's there without a doubt. I mean, is it, does it? Okay, good. That's good oh, to hear. Yeah. I mean, and again, like, you know, you don't look at a Wiseman film and think about it as having a narrative, but it does. It, it just is a incredibly invisible one that isn't laid out, you know? Um, and I think that definitely happens with the book without a doubt. You know, my thought pattern as I was what, going through it, you know, it definitely, and it, it has a real landing point at the end, without a doubt. I think it starts, because I was trying to place it also, and I was thinking, well, you know, what is it? Where, and where does it fit? And there are really popular photography books that are just all portraits of celebrities, for instance. Uh -huh. And they're great. And they're, and then you had something like Avedon's In the American West. Obsessed. Which was the opposite of that, right? Did I mention Avedon to you last week? That's so crazy, because that's who I've, Really, when I started the project, I, I had been obsessing, re-obsessing on Avedon as a creator and as a, as a portraitist and, and using that as a kind of jumping off point. The, the pictures that I did take before lockdown started, the portraits that I managed to do in my studio here in New York and in one case in Paris, were completely and totally inspired by Avedon mm. and by the work that he did, and the, which on the face of it has a, this kind of pop. It's often people that are either easy to look at and attractive or people that are very well known and very public. But underneath it, there's a lot more going on, a lot more happening. And in the American West, or that book that he did was a big part of that. So your book actually kind of smashed the two together in some weird mm -hmm. way, plus adds non-photography, non-photo oriented stuff. But it's as if he took a book starting with photos of whoever, you know, actors and stuff and, and ended, you know, somehow segued into the 
American West photos, yeah. we, you know, within it somehow, but, you know, made it make sense. It was, you know, I just, I really like how the, how the book kind of grounds itself at the end as it approaches the end with family pictures kind of taking the focus in a way. It really becomes about family, the book. The, and, and and in a way it is, uh, it's funny that some people thought that the book is titled Michael Stipe. It's not. I actually kept myself out of the book as much as I could. I put my shadow in there in the, in the final image, a portrait of my goddaughter and her girlfriend. But I definitely wanted to be behind the camera and not be. But as it turns out, it is really, in a way, a self-portrait because it's uh, the, it's the people that I find deeply inspiring in a very difficult time, that difficult time being lockdown and being uh, the first year of COVID and, and all of us realizing, I think, that things will never be the way they were ever again and that this is a very potent and very important moment that we're moving through, but also an incredibly fearful one. So what did I need particularly? I needed to reinforce the idea that these are people who are, for me, fiercely unafraid and fiercely courageous and often that courage and that strength is portrayed through their ability to uh, tap into their own vulnerability and allow that vulnerability to be a superpower. And so I saw myself in them, I, I guess, or I, I saw the the better me that I wanted to become through these people. And it's, again, it's people like LeBron James, who, I, you know, I don't know the first thing about sports or Colin Kaepernick, uh, but I just so deeply admire the stance that those two gentlemen took and putting their careers and their reputations on the line to take those stance I, I, or to take a knee, as it turns out. But anyway, you know, the positions that they put themselves in were, were incredibly vulnerable and beautiful. If people are confused, if people are wondering, I think a lot of people probably would look at, would think the book was called um, Tilda Swinton. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> because, because it, it's just her, man, just that face on the cover. Um, so if people are, are in the bookstore and there, they see it a book that they think might be called Tilda Swinton. That's probably... That's probably my book, yeah. The book that's not called Michael Stipe. <laughs> but uh, that's one of the most arresting photos on the front. Well, I think we're kind of nearing the end here of our 45 to 60 minutes. Can we project, because we just, maybe we can end with this, but we did talk a little bit about the time that we're in, and uh, it's been really odd for me, in terms of time, connecting with people, uh, IRL, <laughs> uh, sitting down at a table with someone and saying, I'm vaccinated, are you vaccinated? Can we take off our masks? Let's have a meal. And then realizing this odd feeling of, well, I've been on Zoom with you or I've been FaceTiming you or I've been, been in contact with you via text for the past year. I haven't seen you in it. In fact, you know, let's count uh, 16 months. And here we are at the same table and it feels a bit surreal. Like, can we talk about that? Because that's where we find ourselves right now. And, and it's such a odd thing. I, I think a lot of people are experiencing this kind of weird, who are we and where are we and, and what, 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 what are we now? Mm. What is time? What is time post COVID yeah. versus what was time? I think we all felt like we had a pretty clear understanding of what time was beforehand. And that, that could be something that um, changed within the limits, the confines of what we think of as time and a timeline and the length of our lives or our careers or our usefulness in society or what have you. And then, uh, and, and, and then now it's like, what is time? Who are we? What, what are we? For me, one answer to that question didn't come out. It's like a really confusing mix of a couple, like on one level, like this, I, like saying like, I don't, I'm not, I don't have to make a movie right now. I'm not thinking about that. That was the, the fact that I was always thinking about it was always about time. I was always going like, oh, I got to make at least 10 movies by the time I die. And I've only made five, like, where, you know, I got to really, I got to get, you know. And when the last one came out, after 10 years of not making one, I was like, I'm not going to wait another 10 years. I'm going to make another movie within five years. Yeah. And then it's already five years. It's, that was five years ago. Now it's, it's, it feels crazy, wow. but it was. Wow. But yeah, so I have these dual dual things going like, A, I don't really care about time right now because who the fuck knows? And B, kind of being confused about it because of how it passed in the last year. And in an odd way for me, it's, a, it's created a much more comfortable spot, even though it's confusing, because I think there's a giving into it on a certain level. And we're still riding right. that wave. We're still right. like, and so like being with people, I feel like I clicked right into like, you know, when you came into the city and, and we got together, it was just, it was definitely like emotional, mm -hmm. but it was also, it also just felt like 
normal. Just great. Okay, good. Yeah, I cried. I, I just remembered that. I cried when I saw you. I was like, oh my God. I, I didn't expect I didn't expect that to happen. I mean, I was really excited to see you, but I didn't expect yeah. that I would have this like flood of emotions at having not seen you for over a year yeah. in, in real life. And that was at the drawing center, right? That was that that kind of those two really great shows yeah. that we saw there. Yeah. <laughs> also the first the first gallery or the first institution of art that I had walked into in over a year's time. Yeah. I'm happy about that feeling of kind of like some kind of normal, but I also think it's there's an undercurrent that is going to make us probably appreciate everything on a different level, which is certainly good. I hope so. I really do. Coming back around, the book opens, the first image that you see is the word today. And the next image you see is a list of names. And I, the idea was to kind of try to allow whoever's looking at the book to just breathe in and breathe out and be completely present. Like, here's right now. And spend a moment with this book. Spend 10 minutes with this book. But be as present as possible. It feels very Buddhist, in, in fact, for someone who has never studied Buddhism. But I think my father, my father was actually kind of maybe a secret Buddha. Uh, now, you know, the more, the more, <laughs> the more I think about him, now that he's gone, it kind of seems like I had this incredible Buddhist mentor in my life, my whole life. And I didn't realize it until he was no longer there. Hmm. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love uh, that. That's a good way to go out. There you go. For sure. Well, thank you, Jim McKay. Thank you, Michael Stipe. Great talking to you. Great talking to you, too. We'll do it again over pizza very soon. Awesome. I'll be there. Thank you so much to Jim McKay and Michael Stipe for being on the TalkCast podcast. And thanks to you for listening. Go seek out as many C100 Film Court movies as you can. They're well worth your time. This episode was recorded at home by Michael Stipe and Jim McKay and produced by Melissa Camp. The TalkCast podcast theme music, as ever, was composed and performed by The Range. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit talkcast.com film and check out pieces by Tom Gilroy, Christopher Munch, and Jim McKay's latest collaborators, Jeff Riker and Faria Zaman. Subscribe to the TalkCast podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you got your podcasts, and go dig into our archive. I'm Nick Dawson, and until next time, take it easy, stay safe.